Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Hey everybody, it's Dinosaur George. This is podcast number 102. I'm pretty excited about this one because the feature creature is going to be Pachycephalosaurus. Now, if you like Pachycephalosaurus, those are the bone-headed dinosaurs, the big domed-headed guys. Uh, we've got some really cool information about them. We're going to do an interview with the owner and founder of the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Research Center, paleontologist Mike Trebold. And we're going to do the Ask Dinosaur George segment because I didn't have time to do it in the previous podcast, and I promised I'd do it in this one, so I will. Uh, Before we get into all that, I want to tell you, with my traveling museum, I have a traveling museum that goes pretty much anywhere in North America. We focus mostly in Texas because we're based in Texas, but we will go anywhere. For those of you living in or around Childress, Texas, or if you have friends and family that live there, September 20th through the 22nd. The Childress Chamber of Commerce is hosting our traveling museum. Contact them for complete details. I don't know if there's an entry fee. I have no idea. Some places charge, some don't. Contact them for complete details. But if you're in or around the Childress, Texas area, or have friends and family there that like dinosaurs, they are, they would love this exhibit. Also, in Post, Texas, September 30th and October 1st, the Post Texas Chamber of Commerce has brought us in to do a um, uh, our traveling exhibit. So for any of you who live around those areas that would like to come in, please make it a point to come in. Make sure and come up and introduce yourself to me. And if you have a question you'd like to ask, I can interview you there. Speaking of that, I was able to interview some young adults when I had our exhibit set up here in San Antonio back in the middle of August. Uh, KLRN, that is the San Antonio affiliate of PBS. They are my sponsors and they hosted a public event and invited the world to come in and I got a chance to interview them. So tell you what, let's head right to that. I want you to hear some of the interviews from some of these young people who I had the opportunity to meet. I'm Hunter. I'm 16 years old. Hunter, why do you look so familiar to me? I've been, I've known you since like, I don't even know. It is so, it is so cool to see you again, Hunter. I can't believe it. You were such a little kid and you love dinosaurs. I I was probably, no, I was probably like four. Yeah, I bet you were. So Hunter, did you, did you keep any interest in dinosaurs or? I have, you know, it's been hard to like keep my own personal interests with school. But whenever I get the chance to do anything like this, I definitely, I jump on it. That's so cool. Yes, sir. What do you think it is about dinosaurs that, that kids just love? The teeth, the size. For, for, for boys, I think it's just like the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Velociraptor. The fact that like being able to see the bones, it's like it's almost alive. You know, and it's just really cool. You know, it, it is amazing, especially like when you were so little. When I first yes, met you, when I first met you and your parents, you were such a little kid, and I can still remember how focused you were. It was like that was the world. Yes. Sir. So, have you discovered girls yet? No, no, no of course not. <laughs> They'll take the place of dinosaurs. That is so cool. So, tell me, what are you doing now, Hunter? What's what's going on with you? Well, right now I'm at the Science and Engineering Academies, but so I don't have too much free time. Right. But when I do. I'm either sports, ROTC, or like Jurassic World, Jurassic Park, watching the movies with my younger sister. My name is Jelani. Jelani. How old are you, Jelani? 11. 11. And how tall are you? 5 foot 4. 5'4". Five, You're going to be taller than me by next year. So, Jelani, first let me ask you, did you like the exhibit? Yes. What, what did you, did you see something in it that you thought was really interesting? Mm, I see the giant crocodile. So how long have you liked dinosaurs? Mm, maybe since I was five. Really? So you have liked them that long. And did you like the exhibit? Mm-hmm. I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, listen, I am so glad. And by the way, I see that you did one of our scavenger hunts. You answered all of the answers correctly. Our scavenger hunts kind of refer to things within the museum, and, and the young people have to go look for the answers. Was it hard to do or not? Hard-ish. What was the hardest question on there for you? Uh, it took me a long time to do the name the giant lizard. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's very hard because we put it in there because a lot of people, when they think lizard, they think dinosaur because so many so many books say that. Now, are dinosaurs lizards? Why not? Can you tell me the reason? Because lizards are reptiles, and, the, and their legs are, are like this. Right, out to the side of the body. That is excellent. Very, very good. This is my buddy, Timothy. Timothy, I've known you for years. In fact, you've helped me with a lot of shows. How old are you, Timothy? I am 11. 11. And, yeah, you've been my assistant on a couple of shows, which is really cool. So, Timothy, let me ask you, what do you think about the exhibit? The exhibit is really fun. You get to learn a lot of stuff. You get to see things that weren't won't be seen again that's right that's cool now have you seen anything that you never knew before until you saw it here um a few a few things like the um the eggs and stuff i haven't really seen those that's cool so do you have a favorite kind of dinosaur um yes it's the t-rex it's a monster, and, but it's really cool to see all that teeth. He is. And have you ever seen a skull? Now, that one that I've got, that one, his nickname is Stan. You know, we give T-Rexes nicknames. That one is Stan. Sue is one that's more popular and bigger, but that one's Stan. So how big do you, if you had to describe that to a child, how big would you say that skull is? It wouldn't have been as big as a... Um, about the size of a table, maybe. Yeah, that's a that's a good description. So, of all the pieces that have been in here, what so far has been your favorite? If you even have a favorite, um, mostly the um the cro- the giant crocodile. It's been very cool because it goes on water, it goes in water, it goes on land. It is humongous. Yeah, you know what's cool about that crocodile, Timothy, is that he lived at the same time in the same place as Tyrannosaurus Rex. So you have two giant predators living together. Do you think they ever fought over food, or do you think they just naturally stayed away from each other? Naturally, I think they stayed away from each other because one lived in water and land, usually, and the Tyrannosaurus lived in the land and usually went out hunting. Right. And taking trees and stuff. That's really good. Well, I'll tell you something, man. I am so glad you and your family got to come. I've known your family forever. But I really appreciate how you've helped me in different shows. And uh, I hope that maybe one day you'll be able to come in here and work with me in the museum. All right? Yep. All right, buddy. Thanks a lot. All right, those are some interviews I got to do with some of the young people who came to my traveling museum. You know, one of the cool things is that some of those kids I've known since they were little, and I get a chance to watch them grow up, and it's a very rewarding thing for me to get to know these kids and their parents and then um, watch them grow up to become really, really fine young adults. So it's an honor for me to get to meet them. When we come back, we're going to go straight into our feature creature, which is Pachycephalosaurus. Would you like to buy fossil replica skulls, teeth, claws, and more? Then visit our catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. We sell replicas rather than real fossils so that we don't deplete the resources. Our replicas and casts are museum quality and look real, but are much more affordable. From dinosaurs to ice-aged mammals to modern animal skulls, there is something for everyone. Visit our online catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com and start your collection of amazing Amazing fossil replicas today. Okay, everybody, the feature creature for this episode is a group of dinosaurs called Pachycephalosaurs. Scientifically, they, they're called Pachycephalosaurids. I'm just taking a shortcut and calling them Pachycephalosaurs. For you young people, I know most of you probably recognize the name Pachycephalosaurus, but I want you to understand that paleontologists place similar animals into family groups. So Pachycephalosaurus or Pachycephalosaurids are two different things. Pachycephalosaurids include the dinosaur named Pachycephalosaurus. So I hope that clears up a little bit of the confusion. So the family of Pachycephalosaurids are who we're focusing on. Now these animals, for most of you, if you see a picture of it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's an animal whose head has an odd-shaped dome in most cases. 
not all of them, but some of them. We call it ornamentation. There are little tiny bumps around the edge of it as well. We call that sort of skull ornamented. Ornamented meaning there are things on it that draw your attention. Think about a Christmas tree. A Christmas ornament is something that you hang on the tree that's flashy and attractive and it's made to make you you focus on it. That's what pachycephalosaurs had on their skull. Now, these are two-legged animals. They're bipedal. Bipedal means that they walk on two legs. An animal that is a quadruped is an animal that walks on four legs. A horse is a quadruped. Pachycephalosaurs, all of them, were bipedal. They had relatively long back legs, and then the front arms are kind of short. Not as short as something like a Tyrannosaurus rex, but they were relatively short. These are herbivores, but... Uh, There's a number of people that have hypothesized, that means scientifically guessed, hypothesized that these animals were omnivores. Omnivores, of course, are animals that eat both plants and meat. The reason for this is when you look at the dentary, the teeth of a pachycephalosaur, you see that they have these leaf-like looking teeth in the back that are perfect for cutting up vegetation. But in the front, they do have some canine-like teeth relatively sharp and so that leads a lot of people myself included to believe that they were omnivores now i don't think that these animals are actively hunting things their own size or bigger they're not acting like raptors but i do believe that if there were bugs insects little creepy crawlies little furry mammals and any small lizards and reptilian critters they could catch and eat i think they ate them i mean there's no reason why they wouldn't it's a great source of protein so anyway These animals may have been omnivores, but that's never been uh, definitively proven. Most of them lived in the late Cretaceous period and are found in either Asia or North America. There are a few exceptions, but these dinosaurs were around at the very end. So the dinosaur families that witness the end of the age of the dinosaurs, as we think of them, the non-avian dinosaurs, these were members of the families that saw that occur. So whatever happened wiped out the pachycephalosaurs. They may have appeared in the mid to late Jurassic. There's some evidence out there that supports that maybe they were around a little bit earlier than once thought so they may have appeared in the mid to late jurassic maybe the early cretaceous most definitely they they reached the pinnacle of success by the late cretaceous that's where most of them were and that's where the biggest of the family was and that of course is pachycephalosaurus he's the largest of the bunch that we know of so far there's two types there are the flat-headed and the dome-headed type now some of these members had this they didn't have much of a dome at all Well, there are some people that believe that those are not their own distinct species, but that they are the juveniles of other named species. And as the animal grows, we see the dome continue to get bigger. Think of deer. When a buck is born, he is not born with antlers. As he matures, those antlers become bigger and bigger and more ornamented. And so it's a possibility that the flathead pachycephalosaurs were just simply juveniles or possibly females. You know, when we look at so many animals in the animal kingdom, most oftentimes there is a distinction between the males and females. They look different. In the case of some birds, the females may be larger than the males, but the males may be more colorful. Uh, In a lot of mammals, the males are bigger and they generally have some sort of ornamentation that shows off their maturity level, which is funny because when you think of humans as men mature, we use ornamentation like earrings, uh, medallions, (laughs) things like that. So, so I guess we've, we've not changed that much when you stop and think about it. Uh, Some of the other things about these guys are their really large eyes. When you see the skull of a pachycephalosaur, one of the things that stands out is they generally have big eye sockets. And that suggests that they, they had good eyesight. But they also had some binocular vision. Now, binocular vision, what that is, is that's the ability to look directly ahead of you. And in the animal kingdom today, most animals with binocular vision use that So they can judge depth and distance. And that's very effective when chasing prey. 
animals with the, uh, with their eyes on the side of their head are more attuned to looking completely around them to watch for predators. So when you see an animal who has canine-like teeth and appears to have some binocular vision, I don't know how much of it they had, but when you see that stuff, then uh, it adds credibility to the hypothesis that pachycephalosaurs may have been omnivorous and may have been chasing things. Again, I do not believe their body is designed for chasing big things, and I don't think they were using that domed head to, say, knock down prey to catch it, because if they were, then we would see all species having it because the young ones would need it as well to be able to survive. I think they're catching little things with their hands or maybe just their mouth. But the most remarkable feature, the most remarkable about any member of the Pachycephalosaurus family is the dome on their head and the little horns that are around the side and base of the skull, sort of or, or ornamented again with those little horns. Now, a lot of times in, in books or in movies, they will show these pachycephalosauruses lowering their head and running into each other, sort of like bighorn sheep. And that was the original thought that that must have been what that was for. But when you look closer at the shape of that dome, you'll find that that's probably not a realistic way to use it. Here's why. The domes on the adult, and definitely what, would, what we would think of as the adult males, those domes are round. They almost look like somebody took a bowling ball and cut it in half and glued the one half to the top of this dinosaur's head. It sort of has that shape. Well, think about this. If you were holding a bowling ball and your buddy was holding a bowling ball and you ran at each other and tried to hit those two together, you would immediately glance off to the side of it. You would slide off to the side because of the shape. It's not flat, so therefore the two surfaces, when they hit, are going to have a tendency to move to one side or the other. Well, remember, though, that in Pachycephalosaurus, its ornamentation included those little horns around the base of the skull and the back of the skull. So if that were to occur, as your head slides around the head of your opponent, your face and eyes are sliding directly into those horns which would mean that the chances are very likely that you would lose your eyesight and no animal is going to risk that sort of thing. So it's not realistic that that's what they were using those domes for. So what were they using them for? Well, some paleontologists pr uh, proposed an idea of something called flank budding. And what that is, is they think the males would stand side by side, one facing north, the other facing south, and it would be a, a battle of stamina. They would swing that dome out away from their rival, then lower the head and swing it back and use it like a wrecking ball to hit the other guy in the flanks. And whoever has had enough is going to quit. You know, giraffes do something similar to that. If you don't believe me, go to YouTube and Google giraffes fighting and you will be amazed at the brutality of these animals as they swing their heads into their opponents in an effort to try to defeat them. So that may be a, a, a sort of a way that they did it is using that method called flank budding. I saw a study, pretty amazing, that suggests that 22% of all of the domes of pachycephalosaurs that have been investigated show signs of something called osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is an infection on the bone that is a result of damage or trauma to the skin and tissue that covered the bone. So for instance, you can have osteomyelitis on your foot and it isn't necessarily that you broke the bone but you may have caused an injury or trauma or a wound to the top of the foot. And that trauma basically caused this, these lesions, these, these injuries, these infections on the bone below. So what they found is 22% of all the domes that they studied showed that the skulls had signs of osteomyelitis. Had they been lowering their heads and ramming into somebody else, we wouldn't see that sort of injury. We would see absolute bone cracking and breakage. It would shatter the bones. But because the animals are swinging their heads into the flanks, into the muscle, into the skin of their opponent, it can still cause damage, 
but the damage is not as dramatic to the bone. So that's sort of a, an idea of what they use their head for, whether it is factual or not. It's the best that science has to offer that I'm aware of. I guarantee you studies are being done as we speak and we may prove them to be wrong. So let me talk about real quickly about some of the different species of pachycephalosaurus, because I suspect most of you are very familiar with pachycephalosaurus. But did you know that within that family, there is a dinosaur named Alaskacephaly, Goyacephaly, Gravitholus, Prinocephaly, Stegosaurus, or Stegosaurus, Texacephaly, he was from Texas, Tylocephaly, Wananosaurus, love that name, Dracorex, Stigimoloch, and the biggest of the bunch, Pachycephalosaurus. Now remember, some of those names that I just covered could be proven that they are juveniles of what are the other species? Like, for instance, Dracorex or Dracorex, however you pronounce it, and Stigimoloch or Stigimoloch, however you pronounce it. Those are possible. It's been proposed that those are juvenile pachycephalosauruses. All right. When we come back, I'm going to tell you a great place to go see a very cool example of a pachycephalosaurus and a lot of other dinosaurs in prehistoric life. So when we come back, you'll find out where to go to see these cool animals. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's Traveling Museum to your community today. All right, everybody. Earlier in the program, I mentioned that there would be a great location to go see a really neat uh, exhibit uh, with Pachycephalosaurus. But this museum is not just about Pachycephalosaurus. This is a spectacular museum called the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Research Center in Woodland Park, Colorado. And with us is the owner and founder of that museum, paleontologist Mike Trebold. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, George. Man, I got to tell you, um, all of the different pieces you've got, I went to your website. I have not had a chance to come up to your museum yet, but I went to the website. You, you've got a world-class museum up there. Well, we really have a lot of fun here, We're that, and that's the bottom line. I mean, uh, I've been involved in all areas of paleontology for almost three decades now, and uh, the museum is an outgrowth of my interest. It's uh, a presentation of the late Cretaceous dinosaurs, and we probably have more uh, marine animals uh, on display here than anywhere else. We've got a big gift shop and our lab in the back, which, of course, is the highlight is where we do all of the the preparation and the and the restoration and reconstruction and assembly of skeletons. So we're we really have a lot of fun here in every aspect of paleontology from start to finish. You know, I've I've got to mention, Mike, back in nineteen ninety seven is when I first started thinking about quitting my career and, and figuring out a way to scratch out a living that had something to do with paleontology. And I want I want you to know mm -hmm. you were the first person that I spoke to. I saw you at the Tucson Jim and Mineral Show, and you were the first and, and quite frankly, the only person I met who encouraged me to do it. Um, I, I've never forgotten that as long. I'm, I'm serious. As long as I've been in business and that was, you know, since 1997, you were the first person that encouraged me to do it. And you were so open about what you did and things that you did. And I found that other vendors kind of looked at me as like a potential competitor which I'm not, but mm -hmm. I, it was like pulling teeth to get, uh, to get any sort of suggestions or ideas. So I just wanted to tell everybody how much I appreciate you and you kind of were the, the final, uh, the <laughs> final step for me to say, I'm going to do this. And now look where we are now. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Hey, listen, we were talking well, about, well, well, thanks George. Hey, you know, I want to add to that just a little bit. Cause I remember that conversation too. And, and I remember when you were you, you were still working for I don't know was it Best Buy or something? Yes, yeah, some, some big products. box company. Yes, yeah, Best Buy. And uh, and you were very enthusiastic, and you had a lot of ideas, and you and you were you're, I could tell your mind was racing trying to think of well you know this might actually work. <laughs> and and, 
but you were hoping, and of course you were willing to to roll the dice. And and uh, and, and and basically, my philosophy has always been, and is to this day, that it's an abundant world. There's room for everybody, and the more the merrier. And and so that's why I, I encourage you. I have no reason not to. Well, and, and I'm gonna, and I'm glad we're both still here. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, one of the things that that uh, the first thing I ever purchased from you was a replica of your pachycephalosaurus. And so earlier in the broadcast, that's what we were talking about is pachycephalosaurus, and that immediately right. made me think of you and your museum. But if I if I understood correctly at that time, and it may be it may be true today, but your pachycephalosaurus was the first one that you found skeletal material associated with the skull. Is that right? Right. That was that was the first time that um, a pachycephalosaurus skull had actually been associated with the bones of the postcranial, the, the rest of the body. Prior to that time, there was, there was only a couple of, well, there was the one classic American Museum of Natural History skull, which, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, American Museum of Natural History skull, which, which is a little bit larger and and did not have spikes, but just kind of knobs on the back of the skull, and there was a few scraps, and there there always has been domes being found, but up until that time, no one had found a, a body that was clearly associated with a very good skull of one of these type of animals, and so in, in that respect, not only are they rare, but it was extremely important because of that fact. So you've got the whole, the, the replica skeleton in your museum. So if somebody really was interested in yeah. pachycephalosaurus, yours would be an excellent example. Of course, you also supply yeah. museums all over the world with your replicas. So um, obviously they can see it in other places, but ideally yeah. I'd love for them to come to your museum because that, that specimen was found and, and prepped by you, right? Or your crew. Yes, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I, I was pers- that was in the early days, and I was uh, directly and personally involved in in uh, the collection and the preparation and the restoration, and reconstruction, all of that sort of thing. And and yeah, we've you know certainly there we've we provided a lot of museums with copies of those. And I mean that's the main part of our business is is uh, getting original and copies of skeletons into public museums. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Resource Center is a, would be a great place to see it, and we could always use uh, more visitors here. We're, we're kind of a, a, a well-kept secret for Colorado. Um, we, we actually have as many dinosaurs and marine animals, if you add them all together, on display than probably a handful of other museums. So uh, it's, it's a small facility, but we've really got a lot of stuff packed in here. Well, that's what, what, what I was going to say is, is going through – uh, just going through your website, which is a very good website, uh, everybody, if you get the chance, the website is rmdrc.com, rmdrc, the letters for Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Research Center. Uh, going going through the list of the things that you guys have on exhibit, let me talk a minute about, or let's talk a minute about the, the fish and the sea creatures, because I don't know of anybody on the planet who has the of the assortment you do of, of three dimensional stuff? Right, we uh, uh, that, that's that's a you know one of my favorite passions is uh, the marine animals from the Lake Cretaceous, the, uh, the you know the water side of of uh, uh, the dinosaur world. And back in 1992, I uh, finalized uh, the development of the first three-dimensionally reconstructed cast skeleton of Xyphactinus, which, of course, is that giant fish from from the Western Interior Seaway. They're, you know, they average 12, 13, 14 feet long. Some of them are quite a bit larger than that. But uh, for many years, I had wondered why most museums had these flat panel mounts high on the wall uh, of these magnificent fish, and they were squished flat, and they were usually far enough away you couldn't even see any detail or or, or appreciate their the size, and and I thought, you know, if 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 I figured out exactly where all these body bones go, the next time I find a disarticulated but complete specimen, which does happen from time to time, um, I could actually take everything out of the rock and and mold it, and then put it back three dimensionally as a cast, which I succeeded with in 1992. Uh, uh, um, well, so we started selling copies of this thing, and of course, it was unique in the world. 
And then in 1997, uh, we uh, collected an identical situation where we had a disarticulated 17 footer, which at the time was uh, the, the largest uh, uh, reasonably complete surfactantist known that wasn't a composite. Well, so so then we had a 12 and a half footer and we had a 17 footer. And then a few years later, I got to think, actually, you know, within a year or so after we introduced those, I thought, you know, there there are, now that we're getting our skills pretty well honed here, we can do the same thing with some of these other very interesting smaller fish from the Western Interior Seaway. So we did it with Pachyrhizotis. That was our next project, and that's about a six-foot fish. Um, and then we did Ichthyodectes, we did Sauridon, and we did Simulichthys and Encodus and, so far. And we have others on the list that we're working on now. But the, the, the key with some of these smaller ones is that most people don't even collect them. Because, I mean, you know, anyone who collects in the chalk knows that you walk by uh, disarticulated partial Simulichthys specimens all the time. And nobody bothers to collect them. Except me. And uh, I made my crew collect them. Uh, you know, grumbling all the way because what in the world do you want this scrappy partial fish for? And uh, over the course of 20 years or so, we managed to collect enough partial scrappy skeletons to know in detail and accurately what every portion of the anatomy was like. All of the Simulichthys specimens on display in museums in the world are inaccurate. They all have, have fudged parts. They all have a whole bunch of plaster in them they're, they're they're not accurate and so after about 20 years i had enough evidence of all the parts combined with the use of modern technology 3d scanning and, and prototyping that i was able to from the tip of the snap to the tip of the tail accurately reproduce this skeleton in three dimensions and and i wasn't going to do it until i knew that every portion of it was going to be accurate. So, and, and, and that's the way we did the Sauridon and the Encodus and the others too. We waited until we had all of the right amount of it, all of the correct information before we went forward. So it was great fun for me. I, <laughs> it's it's uh, 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 when you look at a Simulichthys, for example, crushed flat in the rock. It's really boring. These are really boring fish. When you look at the three-dimensional reconstruction. It's a pretty interesting fish because it has two rows of armored scoops, uh, scoots along the back and along the belly, and it has it, each palatine element has two rows of teeth, and even the jaws, not only do they have large teeth facing rearward, but they have small teeth on the outside edge of the, rear, uh, of the, uh, the lower jaws that face forward. And the same is true with the premaxillary. It's got these little tiny teeth that face forward. So when its big teeth were pulling prey into the mouth, it was simultaneously shredding them with these small teeth. So, yes, as fossils, traditionally, they're pretty boring. But, Man. I, you know, as a 3D uh, accurate mount, uh, it, it's a pretty cool fish. <laughs> My so, God. Anyway. And, and so people can can see these fish. I know that in our traveling museum, we have one of your big Zyphactinus, the the big one. Right. And then we've mm -hmm. got an Encodus and then we have a Sauridon. And I've got to tell you, I have kids that just stand there and stare because every fossilized fish they've ever seen in their life, me included, up until yours, mm -hmm. have all right. been one dimensional flat in a in a plate. And exactly. It's yeah. this three. And we only have the skulls. We don't even have the skeletons. So when they go into mm -hmm. your museum, they'll be able to see fully three dimensional, these amazing different fish. Absolutely correct, and, and in their entirety, all the way to the tip of the tail. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, we just recently put together a, a display with, with uh, and, and this coincidental that I'm using Simulichthys as the example. Uh, uh, we have a nice Simulichthys uh, original fossil flat that's, that's virtually complete. And we have that in a cabinet, that original fossil squished flat, in with one of our three-dimensional ones directly above it. And and like it's like a foot and a half above it, and it's all in a cabinet, so it, so it's you know you can get right up close to it, and it is is a very interesting contrast study in in uh, uh, in how they appeared in life, which is what's my original goal, versus uh, how they appear squished flat in the rock. Wow. Well, you know, one of the the thing that's always concerned me about a lot of the older museums is oftentimes they just stand up these skeletons in a big open room, almost line them up like toy soldiers. And they're amazing and they're interesting. But 
What I liked about your museum is that you really put a lot of thought process into not just displaying the animal, but making it look like it was alive. Talk about a little bit about how you designed your exhibits. Well, well, I appreciate that, Deb, because that, that is always a goal of, of the exhibits that we put together. These animals, you know, weren't living in a vacuum, so to speak. They, they didn't just stand there, or in the fish's case, they didn't just sit there. <laughs> Whatever fish do when they're not moving. Uh, but uh, uh, they're interacting with their environment or they're interacting with other fish. Uh, or other animals, and and so so and, and we use this philosophy with a lot of our dinosaur displays as well as the marine displays. In that, they're they're chasing each other, or they're swimming together in a school, or they're 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 doing something. Everything should be doing something, and not just standing there being its skeleton. And 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 it really gives us a chance to uh, uh, to learn what the uh, possible. Uh, anatomical configurations can be by by pushing the limits. In other words, you know, we have, we, we we know how far back the femur on a on a pachycephalosaur can go because if it goes too far, it's going to rub into the back of the ilium. You know, uh, things like that, uh, th- those sort of things. So when you're when you're building the skeletons, you know what it probably could do, and you have it doing something that's meaningful. Um, and of course, in the case of marine environments, uh, we know it's a very deadly scene. So, uh, a lot of the times, we do pose them chasing after each other with the intention of having a meal. Right. Um, but for kids, and, and of course, <laughs> but, well, for kids, that's a big deal, though, because their imagination takes what you've done and just continues the story as far as their mind. I mean, all the animation ability in the world with television and movies is great, but it'll never compete with the imagination of a kid. So I can imagine kids stand there watching, looking at your fish that are scattering because something's going to come up and eat them. I can, I can imagine they're, they're alive as far as kids are concerned. I think you're right. I mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, back when I was five years old, I saw my first Mosasaur and uh, my dad, uh, I was totally impressed because they had it mounted low where I could get close to it. And my dad was explaining to me, uh, the concept of extinction, and up until that moment, uh, I hadn't, I had no, hadn't really thought about it. And he also talked to me about, you know, this this giant uh, marine lizard that was in the oceans, and that this part of the country was underwater at the time, and it was all fascinating stuff. And and I knew that it was real; it was a true story. And and when things are true, and they're and you know that they happened, and and you're learning that for the first time, that's going to stick with you a lot more than than any fantasy i think uh because you know that that's that's part of the history of life on earth and you're part of that so yeah uh, uh you know that's the sort of thing that we want to inspire in the people that, that come to visit the dinosaur center here well just looking at the images on the website i can immediately just by looking at the way it's designed and the the work that's gone into the exhibit itself you know again oftentimes somebody will hang a skeleton from a wall and that's the end of that. But with you guys, so much seems to have gone into the design of each little vignette, I guess is the word. Sure. It's amazing. So uh, obviously your your pioneering work of three-dimensional fish is amazing. And I would l- very much like to see if I can get you back again to do an entire show just on that. But your museum has a lot of other things in it. Can you kind of describe some of the other yeah. things that are there? Yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, let me say that you know you won't find quilts or uh, you know historical firearms or anything like that here. We're strictly fossils, right. uh, fossils and life reconstructions. Um, the uh, you know Woodland Park is a little tiny town just 15 miles west of Colorado Springs, and the reason why we are here versus in a much larger city like Colorado Springs, a lot of people have asked me that, and I want to I want to I want to answer the question uh, because it's probably the most common one asked. What are you doing in Woodland Park? <laughs> It's a little dinky town of like 7,500 people up in the mountains. The reason why we're here is because the museum is an outgrowth of my primary business, Treebold Paleontology Incorporated, which is a worldwide supplier of fossils and fossil casts. And we've been doing this for almost 30 years, as I mentioned. And, and the museum is, is an outgrowth of that. And, and uh, uh, there are so many different animals that we, that we make copies of and so many new, new discoveries that we're working on in the lab all the time 
that this is something that I felt we really needed to have a public presence because it's kind of a waste to have a to be working out of a warehouse and as soon as you get a wonderful skeleton uh, finished you put it in a crate and ship it away so so uh, because I love uh, living in the mountains and uh, the small town life uh, I decided okay well we'll put it here <laughs> as opposed as opposed to Colorado Springs but when you when you visit the museum you the first area you come into is is the dinosaurs and we don't have dinosaurs from all ages our concentration is on the latest of the cretaceous you know the last 20 million years or so before the major extinction when the dinosaurs were finally done other than birds and uh we have you know t-rex we have nanotyrannus and of course there's a lot of a lot of uh, controversy around nanotyrannus um we have both original and and cast skeletons on display um Stuthiomimus, um, uh, the pterosaurs. We've got we've got a whole bunch of different types of pterosaurs, including a whole series that were that were made from one important discovery. I want to I want to digress here for a moment. Uh, back in 1991, I found the most complete pteranodon ever found. It was a female with about an 11 foot wingspan. We uh, had a friend of ours who was a pterosaur expert, also sculpt everything in the round again because, as most people know, pterosaurs are crushed flat when you find them in the rock. And uh, we took those restored uh, bones, created a, a, a full uh, 3D skeleton. Then we, back in this a long time ago, back when this was magic, we uh, had the bones scanned, and we had them increased to the size of the largest known male. We created a big 24-foot wingspan giant male skeleton, and we also sculpted over the skull and the body of the female to create a life reconstruction. So here there was one discovery that created this whole series of, of uh, uh, pterosaurs. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, we have duck bills. We have uh, uh, usually a ceratopsian or two. You know, a couple of years ago, we collected a, a brand new, unique uh, type of ceratopsian. It was a juvenile from the Judith River Formation, about 75 million years old. Um, it, it doesn't have a scientific name yet. We call it Ava, just, just out of convenience. Uh, you know, we usually give our discoveries uh, surnames when they look promising and uh, that little ceratopsian is just like a triceratops only it's about half size and it has no nose horn um, we usually have a copy of that here we just finished a 10-year project despletosaurus Whoa. very rare it's way more rare than even t-rex it's it's uh, and yet it's the size of a small t-rex uh, there are probably approaching 60 t-rex skeletons on record now there are eight Despletosaur skeletons, and we have two of them. Um, and anyway, this was a 10-year project uh, that we just concluded this spring. We just built the first copy, and it's 33 feet long. It has this, uh, the skull that's as big as or bigger than, than some T-Rexes, and it is, it's a magnificent uh, critter. And uh, um, so uh, uh, anyway, and yeah, obviously we have Pachycephalosaurus here. We have... Thessalosaurs. One of the things about our dinosaur museum is that is that we we regularly change our exhibits. If you come here this summer and then visit again next summer, I can almost guarantee you that at least twenty percent of the exhibits will be changed because uh, we have delegations from museums that come to visit us, and there are times when when they will find something that they just love and they they don't want us to build one like it. They just want that exhibit, and so we take it down ship it off to them, and we build another one. And when we build another one, we usually build it a little different. So there's always things, things changing. On the marine side, yes, we have all of the, all of the, the three-dimensional fish that I mentioned, but we also have pliosaurs, the short-necked plesiosaurs, the long-necked plesiosaurs, uh, several different sea turtles. Uh, every critter, that all of the main characters of the Western Interior Seaway are found here, too. And, and that's one of the biggest surprises to our visitors is that they, they go through the dinosaur section, and they... And they, have, you know, they they see what they expected to see, and then they turn the corner and they go in through this fairly narrow uh, doorway into the marine room, and it's a whole different world. Uh, all of the marine animals do not have as good a press agent as the dinosaurs do because they're just they're not as famous, they're not as well known, and yet they are just as interesting and in some cases even more bizarre in some of their shapes and functions. And and uh, so so the the marine room is is a big surprise to a lot of folks. Plus. At the end of the marine room, that's where we have the windows that open up into the paleo lamp, where you can walk through kind of a tunnel area, 
and you can watch what we are working on in the lab, whether we're assembling a skeleton for a customer or if we're working on original bones, getting them out of the rock, out of their field jackets for the first time. Uh, in some cases, we're doing reconstructions right in front of the uh, the, the window on, on tables, and we're working at anything from uh, you know 100-foot uh, brontosaurs to uh, you know, one foot wingspan ichthyornis, uh, and it just you know at any given moment we're working on a variety of things, and of course that changes constantly. Um, right now we happen to be working on a magnificent thirty-five foot mosasaurus, actually the first mosasaurus, the genus mosasaurus, ever found in Kansas, and uh, uh, we we're we're going through the body right now, taking it out of the original field jackets, and that someday we will mold that because it's such an important specimen, and we'll sell copies of it as well. But um, seeing that thing come together over months, uh, over the coming months, is, is going to be pretty exciting for the visitors. And uh, uh, we're working on a couple of major duckbills, Lambiosaurine duckbills, the crested duckbills that we've collected. And uh, uh, so, and, and we also have usually, we, we, we don't always keep up on this, but we have little, little signs that we have in front of the window that kind of explains what we're working on. Um, we, we try to keep them updated, but sometimes we, <laughs> we'll we be working on a mosasaur and it says we're working on a duck bill. So that happens <laughs> from, from time to time. But, um, but, uh, and yeah, and there's, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the assembly back there too and, and the crating and, and, uh, uh, the research. And of course we have our collections area where we, we keep all the finished, uh, um, fossils until they're, until they're placed with museums. So. Man. So there's a lot to see and there's a lot to change And I, I appreciate the chance to, to tell folks because like I said, we're, you know, un, it isn't our goal, but we are a pretty well-kept secret. There's, uh, there's a lot going on here in the world of paleontology, and uh, we're definitely, uh, I can confidently say that, that uh, if you're interested in dinosaurs or the marine fossils, you will have a ball. Well, you know, one of the, one of the complaints that I hear from people uh, when it comes to various museums, because people are always asking me, do I have a recommendation for a museum? Okay. The, the number one complaint that I get, well, I get two major complaints. One, the people that often work at a lot of these museums don't understand anything whatsoever about it. It's, it's just a job, so to speak. So they don't have anybody that they can speak to or in most cases that their child can ask questions to to get some sort of answers. Of course, mm-hmm. you guys are the actual ones in the field doing the work. So that is exactly. not an issue with you, right? No, as a matter of fact, uh, you bring up a point that, that I, I didn't mention that is that is key to our success. Yes, not only are we the people that actually found the skeletons in about 80% of the cases uh, uh, in our museum, but prepared them and, and, and mounted them and put them on display, but, but we have visitor experience guides, that, many of which have, have actually worked in the lab or, 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 or worked in the field, and the visitor guides know the answers to the questions and they deal with kids and they all the time and, and they they uh, uh they have done such a good job for us and, and actually some of our visitor guides have been with us for 10 years or more um they have done such a good job of working with the public and, and presenting the information and guiding them through the uh uh, uh the, the, the museum um knowing the backstories to a lot of these skeletons. You know, they know the you know that we got our truck stuck when we were you know trying to collect such and such, and, and you know rainstorm hit, and you know <laughs> the sort of, the anecdotal things that that, that 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 the display itself can't tell. But because of the good job that the visitor guides do, um, our approval rating has has actually a rather astonishing about ninety five percent. If uh, of the people who who come through the museum love it if they take the tour because the tour answers their questions wow. and then we give them a lot of personal attention. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I honestly believe by, because I go to a lot of museums that some museums see young people as almost an interference in their day. Like, like they don't want to answer kids questions because they see them as an inconvenience. But the majority of your responses about experience is that you always mention kids so you guys are a very kid friendly and when i say kid friendly i'm not talking about your museum is about barney i'm talking about kids who love dinosaurs yours is a very kid friendly museum absolutely yes probably tops in that respect and i and that's and purposefully so 
Uh, we know how people get interested in dinosaurs and science in general. And if you're encouraged as a kid or if you're treated with respect and if your questions are answered with respect and interest and enthusiasm, uh, that will spur you on to, to a greater inquiry. And I think that's what life's all about. Well, good. And, you know, the other complaint, I said I get two major complaints from museum, from people going to museums. The other is once they've been to a museum, they've seen it. And if they go back, it's the same. I've got a museum locally where people often joke about we've already seen the stuffed buffalo losing all the hair. We don't need to go back again as a reference to it's never any different. But you said earlier in the interview you guys are constantly changing, and, and so that right. makes your museum the kind of destination that is not a once-in-a-lifetime thing. It's the kind of thing that you should go back year after year. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, the, uh, uh, because we're actively involved in the collecting and preparation of, of fossils, uh, and, and, and there are always new things that we finish, and we have no reason to take a specimen that is virtually complete and is important to science and leave it sit on a shelf in the collections room for 20 years. It's important that we prepare that specimen, that we that we mold and cast it so and, and, and re-articulate it so that we can share it with the world. And and that's and that's what we do so many times each year that, that you know, I would say that in not only in, in rotation of displays and new posing and new and new scenarios that we develop out in the in the exhibit halls, but but we probably on average in an average year introduce to the world at least two or three, if not in some years four or five, brand new dinosaurs, marine reptiles, or pterosaurs, um, and and so there's always something new here to see and and to appreciate. That's amazing. Now, one other thing that caught my attention about the museum is how many different things are going on at your museum. You have all these different events. I, I, I constantly see, uh, diff- I mean, things that are not always dinosaur related, but are earth right. science related. Talk a little bit about the different events and stuff that you have. Well, we, uh, we regularly bring in, um, uh, well, <laughs> It's it's you know I don't want to go through the list but but sure. we have there's a portable planetarium that we bring in on special weekends there's like you know the the science guy type of presentations kind of like what you do George uh, where, where we where we have uh, demonstrations of principles of science and 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 and, and uh, that that don't necessarily connect directly to dinosaurs but we're a great venue to have that sort of thing since people come here anyway who are interested in science right. And, and we have community activities, too. That, I mean, things that, that just, uh, uh, for example, my favorite uh, event here is, it has nothing to do with dinosaurs. It's called uh, Critter Rescue Roundup. And basically it is a collection of vendors who, who uh, rescue cats and dogs, but also hedgehogs and, and, and eagles and, and wolves and, you know, all of this other stuff. And, and they take care of these, these animals that would otherwise have a rough time of it and uh um, so that's and that's and that's an event among several that we have involved out in our courtyard too where we have we have tents out on our lawn and in the in the court area and 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 a bunch of different people involved so not only are there things that we do in the museum itself but of course each event that is coming up is put on the website so if they go to rmdrc.com they can see what's coming up in the next 30 days or so and there are some, there's something all every month. There's, there's there's something sometimes two or three things in one month. Wow. I don't personally. I, I don't have time to to uh, organize all that. I'd go crazy. <laughs> uh, but but uh, but we all it, it's you know summer and winter year round. We have something going on uh, all the time. That's that's special and that's that is science or community related. All the, uh, in, in in every case, um, and so. Yeah, it's uh, uh, we're not physically large, you know. We're not a gigantic structure. It's 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 a fairly small building, but but uh, but again, we 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 you know if if you take your time going through, you, there's a lot of uh, interesting things packed in here. That's amazing. And and if they go to the website, they can join. You have a mailing list, right? That they could join to get updates of the things you do. Yes. Oh, well, absolutely. Yep. It's it, yeah. The, uh, you can you can subscribe to the mailings and and uh, and they'll and they'll make sure that they. Yeah. get that out on a regular basis 
and um Amazing. So you guys are open year round, seven days a week, Monday through Saturday from nine to six and on Sunday, 10 to five. But you're closed Correct. on Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Is that is that right? That is exactly perfectly correct. Yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. So I got to tell you guys, um, go to rmdrc.com. Look at the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Research Center. It's in Woodland Park, Colorado, not too terribly far outside of Colorado Springs. If anyone is anywhere in that area, uh, you've got to go. And by the way, students, if there are any kids listening to this podcast who go to school anywhere near there, you need to contact them about uh, school tours because you guys do tours for school groups, right? We do. Uh, we we currently run, a, uh, I think, around 250 school group tours uh, every year, and so uh, and and we're not full up, so we're happy to do more. Wow. Well, Mike, I cannot thank you enough, and I've I got to tell you, I've got you slated. Hopefully, we can get you back on because I'd love to do a a uh, podcast about some of the fish, but then also. I want to do a podcast about what goes on in the field, because I think some young people and, and quite frankly, adults have a misunderstanding because sometimes what they see on Jurassic Park, they assume you walk up and you push some button and there's a dinosaur and you dig it up and you go home that afternoon. So I'd love to get to get with you to talk about some of the anecdotal stories, like talking about getting your truck stuck and that kind of stuff. So would you be willing maybe to come on at a future date? Well, you're exactly right. There is there is a lot of misconception about what what field work is like, uh, and 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 also another subject that might be of interest is is how we're applying the the, the latest technologies to Ooh. what we're doing. The the the, you know, the scan, laser scanning and three D printing, which we're doing a lot of, and 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 so I would be delighted to come back on at some point in the future and talk about the field and or the technology and and, and show how it's applied to what we're doing now and and, uh, visit with you anytime, George. Wow. Boy, let me tell you, I never thought about that. That would be interesting. Well, listen, everybody, make sure to go to rmdrc.com, the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Research Center in Woodland Park, Colorado. If you're fortunate, maybe you'll see uh, Mike Trebold actually working around in there, but my guess is you're probably up to your ears stuck in the office (laughs) (laughs) stuck in the office doing interviews now (laughs) that's the downfall to success the downfall to success is you don't get to do anything fun anymore (laughs) that's exactly right yeah yeah you love it so you start a business and the next thing you know well you don't have time to do that anymore but no i actually seriously i uh uh, my my office is upstairs on purpose (laughs) so not that i can look down on people but so that i have a stairs to climb when i gotta go to the lab and uh uh so I keep some exercise, and uh, and no, I I, uh, I make it a point to go through the lab uh, w- when I'm not personally working on a project in the lab, and, and many times I do, especially the prototypes. You know, the first time we're putting an animal together for the first time and trying to interpret the bones and whatnot. I, I love that sort of thing, so I do get involved in deeply. But uh, but when I'm not, I go through the lab probably three or four times a day at least. And check on everybody's project, and you know, comment and <laughs> make adjustments, <laughs> and uh, and that sort of thing. And and so, uh, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I'm I am involved as much as I possibly can be, and yet I I also have to, you know, because because it's difficult to make a living at this. It it and, and there there are so many different things that we have to do, so many different revenue streams to make them all pay, uh, so that we can stay alive. That uh, yeah, I do spend way more time than I want to behind the desk. Um, you know, we have the museum, the gift shop. We have uh, Treble Paleontology, the company that sells the skeletons and copies to museums around the world. We have embedded exhibitions, which uh, we have two traveling exhibitions now that go around from museum to museum. Uh, Savage Ancient Seas, which is of course the marine stuff, and then also Darwin and Dinosaurs, which is a new exhibit we just put together, which is another subject for a visit. Ooh. And uh, uh, Darwin and Dinosaurs is quite quite unique. Um, and, and, and so uh, these are all things that help keep us alive. And without our visitors to the museum, we wouldn't be alive. So it is very important that, that if, if what we're talking about interests uh, the folks that we're, we're reaching today, uh, come on in. Well, Wooden one of, Park is easy to get to. Well, one other thing about your Treebold Paleontology site, for any of you that are collectors that like, um, I mean, obviously, not many of us have the funds to go out and buy 
an actual three-dimensional pachycephalosaurus skull. But uh, if you want world-class museum exhibits that you can put in your own collection, uh, Mike, you guys, what, what is the website for that site where they can buy things themselves for their own collections? Uh, in terms of casts? Right. Uh, the, uh, the, the casts that we offer are all, are all on the uh, treeboldpaleontology.com. It's uh, uh, way too long of a name. <laughs> I, you know, back before I really knew how the internet was working in the early days, I, I, I you know, I should have just done TPI dot com, but of course somebody took that. So it, yeah, you got to type out treeboldpaleontology dot com, and you got to cor- spell it correctly, uh, and that'll get you to to uh, 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 the website that that actually has a uh, quite, quite a few good images of of uh, the skeletons that we have. And and another reason why we have so many changes here at RMDRC every year is because we can we only have room to show off about one third of the skeletons that we manufacture, wow. and, and and so uh, you'll see a lot more on the treebolpaleontology dot com website that even than you'll see in the museum. We would have to have a huge facility in order to be able to show everything that we make. Well, maybe that's phase two of what you're doing now. Don't think my wife will let me. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be called phase two, the divorce years. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to go there. <laughs> I understand. Well, listen, everybody, tell well, your friends and family about the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Research Center in Woodland Park, Colorado. Yeah, it may be a, a best kept secret, but a secret like this should be shared and it shouldn't be a secret anymore. So, well, I would appreciate and I sure Mike Trebo would appreciate you guys promoting it to your family and friends. It's rmdrc.com. Mike, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to us. Thank you very much for having me, George. I appreciate it. You bet. Well, that was an incredible interview. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope if you get the chance, you've got to go see uh, the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Research Center. That is, uh, that's an incredible place. For a lot of you that have called in about the Ask Dinosaur George segment, I've, I'm going to go ahead and put this segment at the end. For some of you that don't want to stick around for that, I appreciate you listening to the podcast and I hope you come back again because I plan on having a lot more guests to talk about a lot more things. So I'm going to go ahead and tag at the end of this the Ask Dinosaur George segment, and then the segment with the little kids that I interviewed. So if any of you have children that had a chance to talk to me at the Traveling Museum, listen to the end of this podcast, and chances are you may hear those little ones. Uh, For any of you interested, listen. And for anybody interested in the Ask Dinosaur George segment, that's coming up now. It's time to ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents' permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. Okay, everybody, it's time to do the Ask Dinosaur George segment. This is where you can write in through my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page and fill out the form and submit your question. Or you can call the number that we announced earlier. But I think I figured out another way to where you guys can write or call in your questions from anywhere in the world completely free of charge if you've got Skype. If you've got Skype, if you go to my Skype address, which is dinosaur.george, uh, I've allowed anybody to call and leave a message. So I think if you go through there and use Skype, you can call me from anywhere in the world and leave your question and we'll try to answer them. I believe that works. I hope it does anyway. I've been telling people it does and uh, nobody's called me back and threatened to beat me up. So it may work. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and let's answer uh, some of the questions we got recently. Hello, Dancer George. This is Ian from Denver, Colorado. And I was wondering what your thoughts are about Anthocelius. And uh, I was wondering if you think that we might find any evidence of Anthocelius in the future. And my second question is if you think that Carcharodontosaurians or Carcharodontosaurus had feathers. I'm 
I have been very confused about this and I heard that there's not much evidence to support much of it. Okay, and thank you so much for writing. I hope everything is going great in Denver. You had two questions. One was about Amphicelius, and the other was whether Carcharodontosaurus or Saurids had feathers. Let me get to your second question first. I don't know of any evidence that has suggested that Carcharodontosaurs had feathers. I'm seeing more and more evidence that Tyrannosaurs did, and we know that the Dromaeosaurs or the Raptors did. I don't know why Carcharodontosaurids wouldn't. But I think that sometimes we, we can't use these blanket statements that all theropods are feathered because those kind of statements can get us into trouble. For instance, you cannot say all birds fly. So you can't take an entire group of dinosaurs and apply attributes to them unless there's evidence to support it. So for your Carcharodontosaurus, I don't know of any, any evidence that proves that they did, but it's certainly possible considering some of their other relatives do. Now let's get to Amphicelius. This is a mystery dinosaur. For those of you that have never heard of this dinosaur, Amphicelius is a huge sauropod. And all that was discovered from it was uh, some vertebra and a femur, an upper leg bone. They were discovered back in the 1800s, 1877, and um, they got lost. Somehow those specimens got lost, whether they were stolen or blown up or destroyed, who knows? It was during the famous bone wars where paleontologists were actively trying to sabotage the other guy's camp. So I don't know what happened to them, but the estimates based on what bones were found was that uh, this animal may have been one of the largest dinosaurs that ever lived, it may have topped out at over 130 tons. So unfortunately, since those bones were lost, you don't see much about it because quite frankly, there's nothing to discuss because he just doesn't have, there's just nothing really there to discuss. Hi, my name is Jackson. I'm six years old and from Plano, Texas. I wanted to ask you, why Dilophosaurus spread its frail. Thank you, and I'm, I'm glad you are back. Well, hey there, Jackson. Thank you so much for writing to me, and I'm glad I'm back too, buddy. Thank you so much for writing. Okay, so Jackson, Dilophosaurus is a little bit confusing, I understand, because in the movie Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, they show a picture of this little dinosaur with a big frill around his neck, sort of looking like the frilled lizards from Australia, and in the movie, it showed him spitting this black goo, which was supposed to be some sort of venom. Um, there is no evidence at all to support the idea that Dilophosaurus had that frill. In real life, it, it doesn't appear that it did. There's nothing that says it did. That was just something Hollywood decided to add to make the dinosaur more interesting, which infuriates me because what could be more interesting than a cool looking dinosaur like Dilophosaurus? Now, I will say that in the movie, they show a very small specimen. Those things could grow to be 23 feet long. So that's that's a relatively big animal. Now, Dilophosaurus has lived in the early Jurassic period between 199 and 188, 189 million years ago. And we find them in Arizona. So that's where they were living. Its name means double crested reptile. And the reason for that is on top of its head, it's got those two sort of they look like dinner plates that have been cut in half and glued into his head side by side. Dilophosaurus is a predator, pretty amazing looking dinosaur, but unfortunately, my friend, it does not have that frill. That's just not part of him, but he's still super cool. All right, let's take a couple of Ask Dinosaur Georges off of the website. This first one comes from Asa from Moultrie, Georgia. Hello, George. I hope you're doing well. I am Asa. Thanks for, for uh, caring. I was comparing a lot of dinosaurs to birds, and after seeing the frigate bird, I wondered how some dinosaurs would have the same display as its chest inflation display. Thank you for your time. Well, um, Asa, I believe that looking at modern birds is a great way to sort of understand what some of the prehistoric counterparts look like. Whether they have that inflatable chest, now that's more difficult to understand because um, that stuff doesn't fossilize. And so oftentimes it leaves no evidence to support that it existed. So we have to make assumptions when it comes to the soft, fleshier tissue. But I have no doubt in my mind that dinosaurs had those sorts of things as a way to display. 
All right, let's go to Jeffrey from Acton, Massachusetts. Hello, Mr. Blassing. Hello there, Jeffrey. Thank you for referring to me as Mr., but you are welcome to call me George, Dinosaur George, DG, whatever you like. His question is, how and why did the abilosaurids drive the Carcharodontosaurids to extinction if they were smaller? Okay, let me say right off the top that I, I don't know if they did, if the abilosaurs actually caused the extinction of Carcharodontosaurs. I, I don't know if they did or not. So I'm going on the premise, Jeffrey, that, that you you know and, and that you've researched this. So if you did, good for you. So let me just say for the record that since I do not know that they in fact did, then I'm only going to address the question as how can a smaller predator drive a larger predator into extinction? And that's very possible based on a number of things. Size is not the determining factor for survival. It, it doesn't matter how big you are. What determines your survival is how you can adapt. What's happening throughout the history of life, plants are adapting with the changing environment. Plants start it all. Well, environment starts it all. Plants are adapting. So plants are figuring out ways not to get eaten. So they have poison. They have thorns. They have sticky, gooey stuff. Well, plant eaters are adapting themselves to be able to uh, take advantage of the plants, but they have to figure out how to get around their defenses. Plant eating dinosaurs are also figuring out how to get around uh, being eaten by carnivores. So carnivores are having to adapt for the way the new plant eaters are figuring out how to get around their weapons. Well, so size is irrelevant. You can be the biggest guy in the block, but if everybody you eat is faster than you, and you don't figure out a way to catch your food, you starve. So in the case of smaller carnivores displacing larger ones, it could be a matter of they are smarter, they are faster, they had uh, more agility, and they had better weapons. So in the case of Carcharodontosaurus and the Abelosaurids, was that the case? I cannot say because like I said at the first, I'm not aware that they, they actually displaced the other. But in the event that they did, Sometimes it solely has to do with uh, how smart you are and whether you are able to adapt. All right, everybody, that's it for this segment. Um, again, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page. Make sure your questions are short, direct, and to the point. Don't send incredibly long questions because we simply just don't have time to read them all. All right, thank you guys so much for writing me, and, and I hope you enjoyed this. All right, you guys, I saved the best for last for this uh, podcast. This is a recording of some of the little kids that I got to interview uh, in my traveling museum. I I've got to tell you, you guys are going to love this. It is the funniest thing, and these are the cutest answers in the world. I wish you could have seen the looks on these little ones' faces when they were asking me these questions, because <laughs> it is absolutely priceless. This is truly the best part of my job. So take a listen to these little these little shrimposauruses. Ashlyn Christopherson. I knew that. Well, the reason why I know that is you drew me a very nice picture. That was very nice. <laughs> so do you like dinosaurs, honey? Yes. Who is your favorite? I like little ones. Little ones were very nice. They hatched out of eggs. Did you know dinosaurs hatched out of eggs? Yeah, and I found some bird eggs at my house. You did? Asked... Was there a dinosaur in them? Nope. Okay, well, I don't want a dinosaur running around the place. Well, that is so cool. So, do you like the exhibit? Do you like it, all these things you're looking at? <laughs> what have you liked the best so far? Um, it's hard to choose. It is, isn't it? Braylon. Braylon, beautiful name. How old are you, sweetie? Five, take away one. So, you're four. Five, Five take You're going to make me do math, huh? I'm not very good at math. Five, take away one for me could have been 14. <laughs> what have you liked the best? The dinosaurs. You like dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite? Who do you like the best? The Tyrannosaurus Rex. Tyrannosaurus Rex is big. Now, did you have a question you wanted to ask me? Do you remember what it was? Yes. What is your question, sweetie? Did any mammals live with the dinosaurs? What a brilliant question. Did any mammals live with the dinosaurs? Yes, they did, honey. But most of them were very small, and they probably only came out at night. Because there were so many dinosaurs, and most of the dinosaurs would have been kind of naughty and would have eaten those mammals. So those mammals were little furry guys about the size of a mouse or a rat. Caleb, how old are you, Caleb? Let me guess. 
you're 100. 105? No, Jeff. You look really good for being 105, Caleb. No. I can't believe I'm sitting by a 105-year-old kid. No, I never met a kid that was 105 until you. No, you're the first kid I ever met who's 105. I just five. Oh, well, somebody said 105. Who was it? Nobody. Oh, okay. Well, I thought it was somebody. All right. So, Caleb, what did you like about the museum? What did you see that you liked? Um, all of it. You liked all of it? Uh-huh. Do you like the big things or the little things the best? Big things and little things. Oh, how cool. Who's your favorite dinosaur? All of them. You like, you don't even have one favorite? You like all I, of them? I like, I, I like all, every single favorite. That is so cool. And I, and the most, and the most favorite is the T-Rex. So he is your most favorite. I like him too. Do you like him because he's big or do you like him because he's a meat eater? I like him because he lives in Texas. Oh yeah, baby, he does live in Texas. How did you know he lives in Texas? Because I saw a sign that says Texas. Atta boy, I am so proud of you. Have you ever been to Texas? I am in Texas, silly. Oh yeah, I forgot this is San Antonio. That's in Texas now, right? What? They just moved it, I think. Yeah, we used to be somewhere else, right? Weren't we our own country? San Antonio was its own country, and then we joined Texas out of courtesy, yeah. right? I think we're in. That's great. Okay, first, can you tell me your name, your first name, and how old you are? Okay. Calliope. Calliope. Calliope is your first name, and how old are you now, Calliope? Four. Four years old. Are you having fun here? Yeah. What have you seen that you like a lot? What's the best thing? Uh, the crocodile bones. The crocodile is big, isn't he? Yeah, it is. Bigger than me. He is bigger than you. Yeah. Do you know when he was alive, he was as long as a school bus? Yeah. That's big, isn't it? Yes, it is. Do you think he's nice or a little bit naughty? Mm, a little bit naughty. I think you're right. Some of them were a little bit naughty. Do you like dinosaurs? Mm-hmm. Who is your favorite, honey? Mm, the T-Rex. They're cool. All right, this is my buddy Levi. Levi, how old are you? Um, five. Five. So what did you like about the exhibit? What did you see that you liked, Levi? Um, the T-Rex and shark mouth. You like that big megalodon shark? Yeah. He was big, wasn't he? Yeah. So you were telling me a minute ago how the dinosaurs died. Can you kind of tell me again, how, how do you think they died? I think they died because first the volcano erupted and then they killed all the sea animals. Okay. And then an uh, asteroid hit it and then and the volcano erupted again and then all the dinosaurs that lived on land died. That's a very good guess. You know, that's what paleontologists... Do you know what a paleontologist is? Um, they discover dinosaurs. Good job. So paleontologists think that an asteroid, a big rock from space, may have killed them. So that's very, very good. Now, who is your favorite dinosaur of all? Do you have a favorite? Um, yeah. It was the T-Rex. Why do you like T-Rex so much? Because, because they are so big and I, and I kind of like them. Rudy. Rudy, that's a great name for a kid. Let me guess, you're 25. No. Four. Are you five years old, Rudy? Good. And Rudy, who is your favorite dinosaur? Um, um, uh, the, the Brontosaurus. You like the big long necks. I like them too. That's very good. They were big. They were longer than a school bus. That's very big. So could you touch his head? Could I touch his head? Only if I was in a helicopter or he bent down to let me. Otherwise, I'm not tall enough. What about a giraffe? Is that almost like a long neck? Well, you know what? A giraffe kind of looks like a long neck, and they both have long necks for one reason. Why do you think their necks are long, Rudy? Because they, gra- they eat grass. They eat leaves, good boy. And where are the leaves? Are they on the ground or way up in a tree? A tree. You got it. So they look similar, but they're not really cousins, but they look similar. That's very, that's very impressive, Rudy. That's really good to recognize that. Okay, I'm here with my new buddy, Trey. Trey, how old are you? Four. Four. And do you like dinosaurs? Yes. Who is your favorite? The T-Rex. Why do you like T-Rex, Trey? Because he's the king of the dinosaurs. Was he a plant eater or a meat eater? A meat eater. Ah, how do you know he eats meat? 
because because I know because I read it in my dinosaur book. Are you a good reader? Uh huh. I'm very proud of you. Reading is very important. So you like T Rex, and he's a meat eater. Was he little or big? Big. He was big. You got that right. Do you like any other dinosaurs? Well, I like all of them. You do? Do you have another favorite? Well, the favorite is the all the big ones and the little ones, and the other one is. The one with the long tail and the long neck. Oh, they're called sauropods. Yeah. I like sauropods a lot. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George...